Great. Welcome, everybody, to the second to last Metamorphosis lecture presentation here. Uh, my name is Jonathan Kay, and I'll be co-hosting this event with Stefan Julich. And um, we are very honored and proud to be able to um, have a presentation by our very own core faculty, Adrian. And before we get going, I would just like to say that we have one more in this the, the year-long series. There's three in each semester. And our last lecture presentation will be by Stefan um, on April 22nd. So for those of you um, who would like to attend that, please let me know. Um, but without further ado, I'll pass it over to Stefan to introduce our, our guest today. And here we go. Thank you, Jonathan. Hi, everyone. So as Jonathan uh, mentioned, Adrian is uh, relatively new, just uh, kind of one semester and a half now, uh, core faculty with the East-West Psychology Program. Uh, he's uh, is passion, passionate about human transformation and service of the living earth. Adrian is an international facilitator, ritualist, academic collaborator, author, and contemplative practitioner whose work weaves together the psycho-spiritual study of the earth-human relation animist practices and contemplative wisdom. His doctorate, which is from the Philosophy, Cosmology and Consciousness program at CIIS, centered on the confluence of Eastern liberation teachings and eco-psychology, resulting in an elemental framework for self-discovery, healing and regenerative action. Adriana is the author of a handful of books and uh, translator into Spanish of Joanna Macy's seminal book, Coming Back to Life, the updated guide to the work that reconnects the contemplative and earth-based lineages of beauty, wisdom, and compassion. He has honored since his teens serve as the guiding force behind his work in service of personal transformation and socio-ecological viability. Uh, for more information, if you're interested, uh, you can visit Adrian's website at living-flames.com. That's living flames.com and I'll put that into the chat. Anyway, without further ado, Adrian, welcome. Hey, thanks, Stefan. So great to see you here today. And and thank you, uh, Jonathan, for thinking about me for this session. It's uh, likewise an honor and pleasure. And uh, it's been a little hectic here. Sorry for my slight delay, included computer meltdown including the presentation for, for this lecture, uh, but we'll make the best out of it and also have my brother here visiting. So yeah, let's, let's, let's get to it. Um, I would really welcome your comments and thoughts and corrections. So um, the presentation that I have for you that I'll share in one minute is very kind of like the bare bones essential for us to engage in a, in a hopefully um, fruitful dialogue about this. So um, let me, can I share? I can. So, um, okay, here we go. So yeah, Yoga of the Earth Community. I am uh, happy, uh, I feel that I've landed in a beautiful place called the East-West landscape, lands. So um, yeah, I wanna invite you to, to think with me and, and reflect and contemplate and, and uh, yes, just tune into what I'm gonna share with you. Cause I, back then when this came into this world, um, I was really excited about it. And um, ever since I've been trying to uh, refine it reframe it, present it in a way that is understandable. Because <clears throat> I, I, I believe that it has holds a lot of potential. Um, but that may be just me. So um, just bear with me here for a moment as I lay out a, li a little bit of the context and rationale behind this idea of the yoga of the earth community. Uh, initially, I, I, I presented it as the yoga of the earth human cosmos. But that, you know, 
it was a little cumbersome and the yoga of the earth community. So let me clarify a couple of things and then I'll go into the context here. By yoga, I mean, uh, um, of course, alluding to this um, South Asian and beyond tradition of um, reunion with the true nature, ultimate source. But also, I take it loosely in, in an understanding of it as a um, as that's been done by various authors recently, in terms of uh, a broader framework and a extended context. So I um, I use various authors that suggest that yoga uh, intimates a sense of transparency of intimacy and of integration. So those are three key ideas here that I am uh, using or basing on of, of to use that word yoga, union, yeah? So that's the first part of the title and the second part of the title, the earth community is of course um, inspired by this uh, geologian called Thomas Berry um, that probably most, if not all of you know, right? That entails us or suggests this uh, living community, living interdependent planetary community of creatures that uh, the human species are just one of like millions of, right? So the idea of, of the realization of that we are a uh, function pretty much of the earth community is a key component of, of the yoga that I'm gonna present for you today. So uh, having said that, um, here's the broad context that I am kind of inspiring on. Uh, of course, the planetization of humanity, the globalization, the interpenetration in terms of technology and various exchanges, including genocide, ecocide, goods, um, uh, ideas, you know, worldviews and so on that for some started 500 years ago with the circumnavigation of the planet. But for some, it started before that, for some after, but 500 years ago, it's a really good um, example of what I'm trying to get at here. And of course, that has deepened lately after you know the industrial revolution, scientific revolution and the technological revolution that ensued, um, yeah. And so that together with, um, the meltdown that it's occurring at various levels, ecological, social, political, you know, climactic, um, has led many of us believe that we're in a very critical juncture uh, in the journey of the planet, of the Earth community as a whole. And uh, I put there just a, a few of many instances that uh, people have referred to this uh, cultural episode as a uh, crisis of consciousness, which is like a sense of confusion is reigning. Um, and primarily, I want to just be very clear, you know, it, it's very easy to um, equate here the earth community with every single human. And that's a, that can be, you know, in many dimensions problematic. So a lot of what I'm going to say actually has more to do with the industrialized human. And that means for those of us that are um, that have been born and in, I guess indoctrinated in a certain worldview, capitalistic, uh, Western, and so on. Um, so <clears throat> having these two processes together of planetization and sort of meltdown uh, of various biosystems, it is what impel me and many others to kind of like think through or think anew or dream the forward, dream the dream forward, as um, Jung would say, you know? So <clears throat> what did I, the idea here is that, okay, what to do, you know, having faced this. So basically the idea here is very simple. Uh, basically what I'm proposing here for you is that ecopsychology as a lens through which to see the context that I just shared with you went and sat or laid down at the guru's feet. And what I'm going to share after, that's, that was 
one of the um, teachings that was imparted by the guru, right? So um, indeed, by virtue of its being the cause of most ecological woes and the seed of all ecological action, the noosphere, or the um, planetary envelope of the mind, <clears throat> should, from the ecologist standpoint, be the most crucial layer. Its health and its protection from man's own perversity should be one of his concerns. For obviously, nospheric pollution is a source of all pollution. That's I I like that quote. Um, you may not, but it, it goes to the to the core here of, of what was in the previous slide. That um, there's some very at the root level, you know. Um, there's some confusion there, some ingrained delusion, a veil that doesn't prevent us to see clearly whatever image works for you. Like there seems to be a, at the core some things we are to tend to in order to, um, I guess, move forward in a, in a more uh, dignified, um, sustainable, helpful, heart-fulfilling way right? So I won't go into like present to you the, all the credentials of what an eco-psychological worldview looks like, but I put there three quotes to kind of try to exemplify that. And so, of course, one of the key realizations that we can um, just touch base there for a moment, it's the fact that um, human development, human evolution, human health, it's uh, intimately connected with the health of the earth community. It is by definition impossible to be healthy in a sick earth community, right? Um, so that is kind of like the key insight of an eco-psychological perspective. So, Having said that, how would that look like? How does that realization try to grapple with what's happening today and trying to go at the root cause or some of those, let's put it that way. So that, that's the exercise that I'm inviting you to do with me today. So you go to those that know, you go to the teachers, <clears throat> which in this case, primarily it's a, uh, uh, I guess, embodied by Patanjali, the Buddha, and the, actually the earth community herself or itself or thou self. So you go in and present this conundrum to them. And um, I'm like, okay, you, you got it to the point where it is a problem at the level of consciousness. Okay, that's good. Um, and then how do you go about it? Because, you know, this is almost um, almost tr trivial to my mind because it's it's so, in a way, I guess, jaded or common. Say like, oh, yeah, no, that, that's a level. We cannot resolve the problem at the same level of consciousness that created it. Yeah, but what does that actually mean? If we take it one step further, what, how do we go about it? And, and when facing the overwhelm, of the planetary crux that we find ourselves in or the denial or, you know, the very tricky emotions that come about. How do we, how do we do that? So this is how we do it. Or this is one of the ways that we do it. Once we've, re we've come to terms like, okay, there's something here at the level of the root. Um, these would be like, okay, all right. So then what is it there that is not working as well? And this would be the response of the teacher. There's many, um, I guess, proposals in various spiritual traditions, wisdom traditions around the world, West, East, North, you name it, South, that have a list of sorts, very similar to this one, of the things that, that, are, that stand in the way of the... <clears throat> I guess, little you or little me and the bigger reality to which we belong and which we are an expression of. <clears throat> so one of the ways to envision this is that um, 
this typology, it's, it's a theory, it's an invitation that to look to those five nodes of this connection, of delusion, of um, out of which suffering comes about. And so we make this move, you know, in chapter two of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. And also I, I won't, uh, hopefully we can unpack and, and chat many of these things when we get into conversational mode. Um, chapter two, Yoga of Action. He suggests that these five are the big five barriers of disconnection. And like I was saying, that the producers in a way of suffering and avidya asmita raga duesha vinivesha kleshaha. So <clears throat> I don't know if I should go uh, into every one of them, but the idea is that. Um, Starting at the top of Vidya is the um, the mother of the rest, is the ground out of which the other four emerge, and uh, it's but it's very much connected to a, a, a individualized sense of self. Sort of a Vidya coalesces or coagulates a sense of I, and the sense of I has basically only two modes of response attaching to something or reacting to something on the other hand and of course <clears throat> having been born out of avidya he has an ingrained fear of its impending doom or death so that's those are the five places ignorance ego or pride desire or attachment hate or aversion and fear of death or clinging to life in Buddhist tradition, there's a very similar set of um, uh, klishta vritti, as, it, as it's called. Like klishta, like suffering, uh, problematic, or different traditions. Vritti, fluctuations, movements of consciousness. Okay? All right. So then, uh, here's, here's, I guess, the only question in, in so far as the what I'm proposing of the yoga of the earth community and what is it then that needs, that needs tending if we don't have enough time to go about beating around the bush like what is it okay we've pinpointed five things but then Patanjali please help us how would that look if you were alive today how would those places look like and if you were to see this dynamics of the mind from an eco-psychological perspective and that is, I, I guess, the con the main contribution of of what I want to say to you, and which is this. Uh, and I have tables and so on, so many details. And but um, let's go through this this one one spin of, of, of the the wheel of samsara here for both um, human and planet. So basically, the the mama would be konasognosia and. Um, Anyone knows what a nasognosia refers to? Everyone, anyone has heard about that? So it's a, um, maybe you've heard of the phantom limb syndrome where, where people, um, you know, they, were, they don't have a limb, an arm, let's say, but they actually perceive that it's there and they look at the mirror and they can see it and they can move it, but any other person actually looks at that and goes like, yeah, Adrian, I, yeah, I, I don't see an arm there. So anasognosia basically alludes to this um, very interesting psychophysiological syndrome where it's not, it's not that the night that we deny, it just completely bypasses our perceptual system, whatever the event or the thing might be. So that would be like my own take of what vidya would mean in terms of what is happening in the planetary ecosystem. We don't only deny it, but we go about it as if truly nothing was happening because it's, well, because of many reasons. Um, so econosognosia, that would be a vidya, right? So then we go to its uh, individualized expression. And for that, I, I took one of um, Ralph Metzner's 
notions, um, which is very common saying something like eco-psychology or deep ecology, yeah, the anthropocentric mm, issue, human supremacy. Well, here I'm, I'm referring to it as human superiority complex because um, it has it's a little freer of baggage than other co concepts. And it, it hits the core of like, okay, you know, like this is this is how econosognosia expresses itself primarily in us, the human and the industrialized human in particular, feeling above and beyond everything else and endowed with certain essential nature that you don't find anywhere else, right? Just here. Um, so from that standpoint, then the that sense of self has to to um, main expressions, as I was saying before, eco despair and eco aversion. Of course, all all this, but the main one were part of the bibliography uh, uh, before. So eco despair, it's something that you know is becoming more and more um, common these days. So basically, the idea here is that before this notion or similar ones, what the suffering that takes place outside and the non-human world is not deemed worthy of having a uh, genuine impact in my own psyche, my own mind. It's actually very natural, this, this movement, right? It's like, if mind is throughout, if consciousness is, you know, something that we partake in, it's a shared event, <clears throat> it's, it would be very natural, actually, for me uh, to have literally a compassionate attitude or mind toward the other you know, to be with that suffering of the other and express it in a way that, you know, is helpful perhaps. So, but the the, uh, the other side of the eco despair would be eco aversion. And these we don't talk about as much uh, in terms of pop culture and and other places because it's, it's more like these would be, and these would become very clear, hopefully in other, well, I'm, I'm not sure very clear, hopefully clearer, in a table that I'll present to you, in the, I think in the next slide. But the main expression, so can hopefully I can express this a little better, would be uh, the military industrial complex, would be a uh, societal cultural expression of eco aversion. So it's basically instead of uh, retrieving and, and pain and suffering, it's actually um going about it fiery expression of that same pain of disconnection and denial um and finally global dread which would these days would we would refer to that more commonly as eco anxiety um but this one was coined by this australian philosopher that um it's truly the anxiety and fear about the impending doom of the Earth community. And for this, it's becoming easier and easier to tap into this sense, felt sense, because the news, because of the historical, uh, if it's not a drought, it's historical uh, rain, and so on and so forth, right? So uh, it's like the, the unraveling of the systems that uh, have served to maintain life throughout eons. Literally. So anyway, these would be the five, the, the five, as I call them, eco-psychic afflictions or ailments. And this, is, this would be my very limited, I guess, uh, channeling of, in a way, of Patanjali as he as if he were alive today, how would he see the cliches? This would be one of the presentations for that. Okay, so um, bear with me here. Hopefully this helps because um, there's a lot of information here in a table format is not super inviting, but let's, um, let's stick with one of them. Uh, well, first off, let, let me just share a couple of things. Um, here you'll see the five eco-psychic afflictions and their different levels of expression within the earth community. 
so I, I broke my brain trying to uh, find uh, like direct correlations, but I, I that's, yeah, that's another whole uh, um, presentation because it draws from different traditions and uh, it's not linear and they're very multimodal and multidimensional. So, but this is just one presentation. So if we go with eco despair, for example, one of the ways that I thought it would be helpful is that uh, each of the eco-psychic elements, places, are connected to an element, a buta. Uh, um, and so this helps with the intuitive and somatic grasp of the places and eco-psychic elements. So this is water, the emotional body connected, right? And it expresses itself primarily to pain, grief, hopelessness. Uh, and, and how does that look like at a societal level? Emotional suppression, technological fixation, uh, and many other things, right? That is not even sanctioned to talk about the suffering of, of the other, needless to say, of the other than human creatures. It's not a an in thing. It's like it's frowned upon. So how, what do we do about that? Yeah, we'll, we'll look for instant fixes. Um, and then I would add there, like it says below, techno addiction, celestalgia. Then we become enmeshed in this addictive cycle that ultimately end up amplifying the sense of eco despair. So it's truly a very cir circular logic that um, I try to present here in a sort of linear fa fashion, but it's more like a systems uh, approach to the situation. So the industrial driver of it is consumerism. Um, and so there's longer tables like this one. This is just like a, a snapshot of the, hopefully um, this helps clarify um, what I'm trying to get at, what I'm trying to convey here. Um, so let me present to you one, just a little bit more in detail, econosognosia. And this is a type of, um, in systems thinking, we would call them positive feedback loops and not in, in the, not in the positive that comes to mind initially, but in the positive cell reinforcing. It was more like a vicious cycle rather than positive in a good way, quote unquote. So um, yeah, econosognosia, we start at the top. Um, it expresses itself as something like ecopsychosis or literally madness. And here I, I need to, you know, um, frame that from an eco-psychological standpoint of like, truly, if the, if, if the measure of health and viability and ultimate fulfillment, it's intimately connected to our mutual home, the destruction of such home, it equates to a self-destructive behavior deemed here as ecopsychosis, because we actually normalize that pathological behavior in industrialized yes. societies, right? So I'm going to not use the, the chakra uh, association at this time, because um, let me just name, the, name it. You know, there are some potential connections, resonances, because here a lot of the sympathies that I use to um, try to give voice to the various expressions of the cliches are, are of course based on this ancient idea that in the West we find primarily in the alchemical and, and magical traditions of like equals like, like, you know, like fear of sympathies and so on is very much ingrained in, in the system that I try to build. So uh, because it's associated with the element of space in my mind, right? So then one of the chakras that is connected through the element of space is the Vishuddha chakra. But let's pause that for a moment. And then we, we bring it to the physical body. That would be the actual spaces, like physical spaces that you find in the body, you know? Um, so following that same logic, hopefully, hopefully it makes sense because space is the element that in a way is the mother of all the 
rest of the elements, the other four, right? Out of the absolute came this, the space. And then in in an uh, evolutionary journey, all the way to Earth, right? The most dense of them. Anyway, so we keep moving in this in the cycle. Um, how does ego nasognosia express itself? Defense mechanisms, psychic splits, divertive strategies at the individual level, the psychic level. And so those ultimately invariably turn into um, pervading lack of meaning, pervading sense of lack, meaninglessness, disconnect from the source, triple sense, self, triple self awareness. So, um, when you know when working through this um give me one one moment no no it's better thank you the family visit um so yeah hopefully the lack that i'm getting at here so in a way of video Iconasognosia, uh, and in terms of this reading, the most direct expression of the ultimate source of the true nature of reality, it would be the earth community in its integrity. So by by virtue of having this this, this original trauma of disconnection, it, I am suggesting that is tantamount to a disconnection from source or whatever word you want to use for that right so there's these processes at a, at a cultural level societal level that keep this loop in place anthropologists would call that a cultural cognition cognitive dissonance connected with this ingrained sense of belonging that we know like many um, studies suggest that there's mounting evidence of you name it and if that mounting evidence goes in the opposite direction of our own worldview and values and beliefs, we are not gonna, you know, not a cognitive or a perceptual change is gonna take place because of this very ingrained need of being part of something. And the problem here is that we're being part of something that it's a highly parasitic, so how does this delusion, this uh, veil of Maya is kept in place primarily by this constant bombardment from mass media, this bombardment of these seed ideas that reinforce a sense of disconnection, right? And so the uh, layer of earth associated with space and that would actually already hint at the remedy would be still open landscapes deserts mountaintops and any other place like a snowy landscape for example you the, the, the silence and the spaciousness that reigns there is phenomenal so and the associated planetary layer would be the moon sphere um okay I'm, I'm gonna end very soon because I would I love to chat with you about this. So basically what I'm suggesting here for you today is that the yoga of the earth community entails some kind of earth human alchemy. Um, and that uh, once I remember the question that I was posing in the beginning to avoid the overwhelm when we realize that we need to uh, seek at the level of the roots and not of the branches, so to say, um, what is it that we need to tend to? We found the big five, we found how those are um, expressed in, the, in a sort of like non-dual perspective, you know, human earth. And then, um, and then what? How do we oversee their transformation, their healing now that we know what is it that we need to tend to? So this is where uh, the earth human alchemy comes in, which uh, it's basically by, it begins by naming the afflictions that actually can potentially activate or move the energies in the direction of healing. 
because if we're not even aware of such uh, occurrences, it would be hard to bring them to a more fruitful expression. So uh, <clears throat> I don't have time as much to um, deepen here, but the idea that the, uh, the key idea here is the following. I'm, I'm kind of, yeah. That, um, you know, in a lot of remedies, a lot of the remedy is an intimate resonance with the issue. So the antidote has a little bit of the poison in it, right? So this is the idea here that once we become aware of, of the psychic afflictions, we've become familiar with them, then that provides an opening from which we can relate to that in a very different way that facilitates this quickening. Yes. So what would be the um, uh, that quickening element that alchemy speaks about here in order to transform the eco-psychic il ailments in elixirs of reconnection and guidance. And the idea is very simple that is so in front of our eyes that often we don't see it. But it is it's said in you know various scriptures and traditions in it's basically compassion. It's basically you know an open heart, a spacious somewhat clarified mind and a, an altruistic disposition to look at that in a different way. And so um, the idea here from ailment to elixir, of course, it's grounded in alchemy. And uh, elixir uh, alludes to amrita, amrita. Uh, but I'm suggesting here that there's a whole earth amrita if we engage in this process. That, you know, I get even from an ev evolutionary standpoint, this can, this is a fresh, uh, this amrita, it was nowhere to be found for previous seekers. If we actually, you know, entertain the idea that, that what's taking place at a planetary level is something unprecedented. So perhaps the, the um, refinement and level of um, purity, to put it in a way, or, or, or um, light of Amrita, it's equally unprecedented. And then I, I put a quote there, uh, a passage of the Yoga Sutras that hints at the um, sort of the result of the earth human alchemical um, endeavor. And remember the three words that I share with you in the beginning intimacy transparency, and uh, a sense of integral belonging. So this is one of the main sort of ideas that informs that. The accomplished mind of diminished fluctuations, like a precious or clear jewel, assuming the color of any near object, has unity among grasper, grasping, and grasp. Not too poetic, but truly it's speaking about this unity of consciousness that uh, the move from eco-psychic elements to elixirs of reconnection is pointing out. And so um, I'm almost there. Um, this, I'm not going to go into this, but the idea here is that um, there's a long set of correlations that the yoga of the earth community, it's inviting us and moving us toward the, the revelation of the true nature of each of the eco-psychic elements as elixirs of guidance. So um, for example, you have at the bottom, Iconasognosia, Vidya, um, what would be the exalted expression of that? It would be a kind of contemplative revelation by way of self-reflection and uh, studying of the mind and heart, for example. The, the remedy of the human superiority complex would be this uh, instance of um, growing in altruistic behaviors so as to um, realize that with, that we are uh, enmeshed, as we were saying in our class yesterday, I think, 
of this, this realization of interbreathing, for example, that we are breathed at all times by the lungs of the world. And so this radical interdependence of all phenomena that we're part of uh, would exemplify one of the elixirs and so on, you know, acceptance, acceptance of reality as it is and not the way we wanted it to be and so on would be a remedy uh, that emerges out of eco despair. Empowerment on or nonviolent engagement would be sort of the, the enlivened expression of equiversion and equanimity would uh, be the antidote for global dread. Um, so hopefully you find it at, at least 10% um, uh, interesting uh, as I do, because uh, sometimes when I go through these things, I feel like, oh, people are just getting so bored because there's tables and, uh, you know, it brings back memories of a class of mathematics or algebra or something. Um, but one, the last thing that I want to say here, and then the last one is the last slide, is that um, I feel that so each of each of the clashes, ecopsychic afflictions, elixirs, and so on, has a as a ruling myth, as I put there, or a story. And that I found that trying to explain to folks um, how to go about this, it's very helpful. Of course, as 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 you all know, the starting from uh, telling the story rather than going about it in a different way. Um, and for a lot of people, that, that kind of makes sense. Okay, so I just put here, there are a few of like uh, contributions that I envision of uh, something like the Yoga of the Earth community. Like I said, I'm, I'm glad you uh, you were able to bear with me here. I just put very bare bones in the slides and just so as to hopefully entice your interest and because of my meltdown of the computer and also just to have hopefully an, an engaged dialogue. Um, but for example, hopefully what I so briefly presented to you uh, just invites the consideration that uh, we are connected to a larger reality in so many other ways than we had previously envisioned, perhaps. That's one of my hopes. Um, and as it was originally um, formulated, the idea, the main contribution was like for some of us that see that consciousness has some sort of relevance in, in not only in spiritual, psycho-spiritual unfolding and development, but also in the state of affairs of the world, right? Um, like would provide a somewhat of a solid reference as to like how to uh, focus our efforts if we wanna touch that level, right? And also as a reference for uh, various uh, practices that we could build on that map, uh, both at a personal and a um, group level. Yeah, eco therapeutic, spiritual practices. And I guess something that I didn't say in the beginning, but uh, hopefully came through you, what I share with you is that um, this wave of, of um, you know, I guess integration of, of various wisdoms into um, the spiritual and religious um, approaches to life. So what we're dealing with today, and I wanna end there, is that uh, something so big that the wisdom teachings that we have, uh, we're privileged to have a connection with are needing to reformulate and um, re-engage in their own invitations so as to tackle in the best possible way what we're facing. So these, the yoga of their community would be 
I don't know if it's a good example, but an example of that uh, uh, kind of like evolving reformulation of helpful guide points. So, so, so okay. that's that's what I got for you today. Um, how did I do with time? Thank you okay? Great. Thank you so much, Adrian. That was beautiful. And uh, I'm, I'm one that gets very uh, interested and inspired by the types of uh, diagrams. And I do see them as as invitations um, for for deep, like contemplation, um, you know, an aphorism or something, something shorter. Um, that's a different kind of contemplation. I think that I love how you're engaging in, um, in, in kind of that integration of the of bringing in the intellect in its full force, but not being limited by it, looking, looking, looking um, through and using it to its advantages, but also looking into integral ways of knowing um, that are beyond kind of that, the, the privileged status that we've given so much to the, the, the cogito and the, and the, and rationality in our times. So that was a, a wonderful uh, talk. Um, and I maybe I'll just jump in and, and start the conversation. Um, if anybody else is, is, I mean, I'm sure we have lots of people that want to join. You can type your uh, question in the chat, and Stefan and I can can facilitate uh, reading that out. But raise your hand um, in the reactions button at the bottom. Um, that would help keep track of things. There's not too many people here, so I'm not so worried. Uh, there'll be space and time for everybody. Um, but I just wanted to, to one one thing that I was thinking based on the the kleshas and kind of kind of as you were drawing out our need to confront confront them in in basically the shadow of how this these are are being played out within our own our psychologies but also culturally speaking um and i was i was being drawn to think i guess i think you were invoking kind of how can we open to the, maybe more of a non-dual sense of how can how we engage rather than a, a binary sense of like these clashes are these are are the are we have to avoid these at all costs these are this this is what each one of them means and this is wrong or bad or this is it kind of create creates a kind of a an absolute binary sense um which would be more like like uh I mean, it's not a morality, but it's more like it's a it's a fixed binary. And I was thinking, just before you said it, how each one of those to me seemed like more like it was about dis decentering or dislocating the the neoliberal sense in which we understand these and opening them up to maybe like to collective Earth community to to cosmic community. Um, in a, and and getting beyond the binary sense, you know, so something like like um, the ego, the desire. It's interesting because the like it's not necessarily that the ego is bad and we must eliminate it at all costs or or whatnot. So taking a hard line like that, but it's more like how can we actually understand not the ego of the I, but the uh, but let's say a self um, self recognition of a we, like a collective, like you know, a collective sense of of self in a way in, in a productive sense you know and another one that that was that was in the clashes was desire and some of the the thinkers that i like to study uh like uh deleuze for instance is is looking at or even going back to spinoza but and then taking from the the indian traditions as well uh the tantric side um in some degree but it's like desire it can also be thought of as the the root of all all, all of existence in a way, the underlying uh, force, you know, like the the Shakti in a way, the, the the creative Shakti. But again, it's like desire through the individual kind of neoliberal subjectivity and and through that the the ego formation that that has amounted to. It's that's a, that's one way to think about desire. But how do we actually? I mean, the the creative question is not to say, well, this is just desire is wrong, and therefore we should become and um avert, averted to that it's more like well what about what's the what is a, a way that we can creatively engage in dis decentering that destabilizing that but then finding so let's say desire in a different sense in an in in like a cosmic sense or a, in a different collective sense you know and so i think that that idea of like the, the cure 
and the poison being contained, like that idea of uh, Plato's idea of the pharmacon, is, is actually, to me, I think the most inspiring invitation to be creative um, with all of the elements, including the shadow side, including like, it's not, a, yes, it's not a, a matter of continuing to use this mind to section off things and say, this is, this is absolutely not part of our, like, we are embedded in, in all of the, the, like the ecology that like the, the world ecology, we are embedded in, it and we have to, I think, work with all of the forces, um, you know, in creative ways to definitely move towards a new future that eliminates the the poison <laughs> absolutely but i think that it's i think that your talk really brought out that kind of that that creative invitation in, into more spaces where maybe maybe more more pushing into the question of non-duality and, and pushing beyond the ways in which we are kind of overdetermined by binaries anyway that was more of a comment but that was so inspiring um your talk and if you have anything to respond please do well, yeah, just rather brief, just to uh, echo what you named. I, I feel that there's so much there, and and probably Stefan could also add a lot to that dynamic. But truly, um, I do feel that it's a very spacious approach, non-dual, because you know if we put it just for one second, the image of like these tables, right? Uh, it's very linear, but it, like I said, it, mm, no. It's not necessarily like, oh, we start bad and then we get better, 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 better. It's so much more complex than that. Um, and so what I would add, just uh, a different way of relating to the cliches means that the cliches transform into something else. You know, like that's, oh, okay, klishta becomes a klishta by way of putting myself here rather than here. So um, that's kind of like, oh, okay, that's part of the alchemy um, that, that I was trying to, you know, just name, but that's absolutely, that you hit the nail right in the head in terms of so many good things of the, of the yoga, like the way I see it, the yoga, the earth community basically has to do a lot with that process. So just basically, you know, echoing what you just shared, Jonathan. Cheers, yeah. That. Um, and Stefan, before we, we take questions, do you want to, to jump in with anything uh, before? Um, on this topic, this particular topic, but, I'm just, I, you know, I've been thinking a lot lately about, and, and forgive me because, because I'm, that I'm inserting myself here for those who are waiting, but really, really quickly, I've been thinking a lot about uh, em, embodiment lately, preparing for classes that I'm teaching next semester. And as, as you were talking, Adrian, I was also thinking about, okay, where does this live in the body? And, uh, you know, I'm, I have my partner is from India, and her parents live in Delhi. So we visit Delhi a lot, and Delhi has just about the worst air in the world. <laughs> and I began to notice on trips there that I was anxious a lot. And I kept wondering, what, where is this anxiety coming from? Where is this anxiety coming from? And it was pointed out to me that uh, anxiety often lives in the lungs. Um, and the, I, I am having trouble, you know, my lungs are, are, are my kind of weak spot. So it was interesting to me, and maybe you could correct me on this, that um, you were talking about eco-anxiety and it was related to respiration. So I'm really fascinated in the way in which these kind of manifest in the body as ailments physical ailments or physical signs of distress as well. Yes, that's great, Stefan. I, I love that. And I, um, that's part, part of me wanted to have such a neat uh, system of correlation that I just very quickly had to give up because I looked at various systems uh, like Ayurveda, traditional Chinese medicine, like Western esotericism, Jungian psychology, uh, like the five Buddha families and so on. And I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't come up with, a, a, you know, an elemental and nicely neat association. So I, I did what I could. Um, and for example, one, one of the key, I guess, references that I used was the, the commentaries of the Yoga Sutras. So the commentaries, they, they, um, 
they try to give voice to the clashes by certain elements, right? And the commentary, just to be, give a very brief example, um, avidya, it's, it's said to be earth, the ground, and I just turn it the other way around, right? Uh, the space. And so I, I would associate anxiety with the element of air as your, yeah, like your naming, like in, in, in what I try to do there. So yes, and, and then we could go on with metaphors of pollution and how does that, you know, impact the physical body as, as in connection or correlation to the communal body <clears throat> and how the atmosphere then um, may serve as a vehicle for disease or for reconnection, depending on how we relate to it and whether we honor that in a good way and so on. So um, that would be, you know, the, the last bit I want to share so others have the time is that uh, the initial plan was to develop, and I have, to, I guess, to a certain extent, practices that would go along with each of very specific practices. And for the one you're mentioning would be, of course, pranayama, right? And, but also touching on other um, ways of breath work, like holotropic breath work and so on. But literally, uh, my hope was to, if we touch on that element, like some, some of the alchemy would, would happen, you know, for your healing and mine and, and everyone's. And um, yeah. That's wow. beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that Luna was first, and then we also have in the chat Matt and then Christo, kind of in that order. Thank you. I'm re really doing my best to stay on point, but I want to just begin this conversation with my point of entry in this dialogue, in this community. So um, my point of entry is, as far as formal education, there's sociological studies. And then in my master's program, I went to seminary, a progressive seminary. Okay. And then now I'm in a PhD program at CIS in the anthropology and social change. So that's kind of what has also led right now to this moment with you, uh, the, the, the spiritual formation of my vocational identity, which is now being integrated. Yeah. So I, I figured that would help you, Adrian, to understand, to contextualize. Yeah. So these three critical points, right, in your first slide that we're living in, we're all right now in this moment, crisis of perception, crisis of consciousness, crisis of meaning. And you cited the term of industrialization versus non-industrialized consciousness or societies. And for me, it's modernity, right? And so as I was looking at this, and then when you were talking about antidote, unitive consciousness, and having this understanding of a whole earth Amrita. And um, prior to my coming back to school, having dropped out at a traditional age and coming back later in life, that was the path I was leading, the yoga practitioner path, et cetera. And one of my embodied practices to ameliorate this crisis of perception, consciousness, and meaning has been yoga nidra, which is right, hanging out in that level of the subtle body, right? The pratyahara. That said, the question that comes because of the stage that I'm in, in my research, for you and really for the community, because if really what this is about is, cut, it, it is to return to a point, to, to a place of embodiment, because we've been so disembodied from modernity, industrialization, East, West. And we're all looking at how do we live? Because the consciousness right now in this community is we all know life is in binary, right? We know this. So how are we going to live in a way of being that's both beyond and in between? While we're attempting, as you propose, to come together in a unit of consciousness to bring forth this whole earth Amrita, which for me, that's the theory, the praxis is the Rasayana, yeah, right? I can eat the Rasayana, the Amrita, yeah, but I've got to be engaged in a way, 
uh, as a social being that's wired into me. So here's the question I want to ask you is based on, you know, your East West, because I'm looking at it from East West, global, North, global, South uh, perceptions, consciousness and meaning. Um, what do you perceive as the temporality of modernity's manifestations? And what I mean by that, is it present, past or future? Is it an infant? Is it a mature being? Is it an elder? Does it live in one lifetime? Does it have many lifetimes? Has it arrived from the past, from the future? Does it have memory? Is it self-aware? Can you know its beginning? Can you know its end? Is it immortal? And when in time does it imagine itself to be something other than modernity? So that's where I'm hanging out, right? And you, that's why I'm here with you because I was like, okay, I got to see where he's going to go with this because I'm attempting to spiritualize my intellectual um, articulations in my research, right? So that I'm not reifying the disembodied state that, that, the uh, neoliberal educational uh, institutions do to us to hang out from here up to disconnect. So I'm gonna keep it at that because that was kind of a lot, but I hope it was enriching. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Well said, Luna. Um, so I heard many things and I'm gonna try and talk or reply to one of them. And it would be like, so when at some point when you start your question uh the image came to me i just did a, a class this morning on systems and shamanism and so um with the last exercise we did there was to um this um practice of mentor bonding and uh connecting with the with the inner child so uh that's the image that came when you said about modernity how how does it you know uh, envision itself can can it envision itself in something other than and the image that came is to um that modernity would be akin to somewhat of a child a little broken one that uh needs some tending in order for it to envision itself and mature into the next evolutionary phase and so, um, because it, it thinks it has a lot of uh, perceptions of grandeur, you know, like, oh, I'm so wonderful and so amazing. And I'm, I'm the center of the world. So like the second cliche, like the human superiority complex, um, we see that in, in teenagers very much so. Um, so this arrested development, how is it? So the way that I'm reading your question is that how is how is that how can we facilitate the blossoming into the next phase of the uh, development of modernity's child and and the response or one of the answers would be to get back in touch with the Earth community to seek out the ways that the child can go outside and play um, and realize that it's part of bigger realities and, and systems. Um, I can keep going, but I, I feel that, you know, that's somewhat okay. Um, and we can, thank you, Luna, again. We can tackle some other was there something in the chat you mentioned stefan yeah I, I don't know so there are two questions in the chat um one of them is is more a comment but uh i think if you have a, a background in teilhard at all um this might be interesting just thinking this is uh from matt just thinking that uh, the elixir slide might be close to what teilhard as a jesuit called the christosphere or the christosphere the sphere of love within the newosphere as the universe amorizes, uh, amorization, uh, and gravitates towards greater density slash love slash integration. Yeah, just a quick comment there. Thanks, Matt, for that. As 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 you well know, so um, 
I drew from Telhar's work and other visionaries from the West in order to in include explicitly this evolutionary, uh, I guess, perspective, right? And, and the word noosphere and whatnot. But yeah, I would, I would, I would hope so. What you're, what you're naming that, yeah, I would hope that the, the elixirs would very much align with this, this process toward greater unity, integrality, and and love. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Adriana. And then from uh, Christo, uh, it was first a thank you um, for the excellent presentation. Um, I too love these attempts at cross-discipline correlations through tables and charts, yet I need to contemplate them at leisure. Are these charts in your 2013 publication or available elsewhere? Thanks again. Oh, thank you, Christo. You know, that something happened to me, I have to confess here with this research, that it felt so personal and so intimate that uh, I, I, actually, I actually didn't publish it anywhere yet. Uh, because, you know, I don't know, something, I'll tell you more about it in another time, but um, so basically you have access to ProQuad dissertations and you'll find my dissertation and all those tables are uh, as append appendices on the manuscript. And if, yeah, I can also share them with you, but just as a general I comment that. And yeah, the idea is that they'll take the shape of a book, uh, hopefully sometime in the near future with the input of people like you and others, you know, to make them a little more enticing. Well, that would be a good reason for keeping them uh, uh, hidden or uh, not not public at the moment if it's going to be in a book. Yeah, I guess maybe. But you see, there was there was definitely something that just felt so much um, me that it felt like if I would put out there, put them out there, it would be like stepping out of the closet so much that it made me uncomfortable. I'm like, yeah, no, not not yet. Hold on. Something like that. Um, but yeah, <laughs> thank you, Christo. And uh, Adrian, this, this might be something that's near and dear to your heart, raising a child as you are. Uh, Dana's asking, how might yoga of the earth community be used as a curriculum in K through 12 education? Yeah, um, I've thought about that. Not a lot, but I've thought about it about it and the way I, that I would envision that is by way of the elements and I, and if you notice I didn't present it as much in this in this uh, time but uh, it is a, an amazing starting point and that's the reason why the um, the research sort of like or the proposal was the integration of the Indo-Tibetan theory of the elements with Patanjali's theory of the glaciers. That was basically right there since the get-go. So um, I feel that, yeah, an elemental curriculum that would explore the, diff the different levels of expression of the elements in terms of contractive or uh, defective, no, but like obscured or, you know, limiting and uh, other more open-ended, connective um, expressions of each of them. I, I would think that hopefully that would be a user-friendly way to approach the yoga of, of their community. Because the elements, you know, as, as a word that I actually didn't use and I'm proud of because it's one of the key concepts here is that the elements are like anthropocosmic teachers of, that, that help us <clears throat> unite inner and outer upper and lower, you know, and all these polarities that um, Jonathan was um, pointing at, there's the elements are such uh, guiding figures. So that's why I call it the elixirs of reconnection because they have this, this quality of like almost, if you will, like a, like a psychopomp quality of, you know, connecting the worlds, weaving the threads. And so, they're uh, really helpful. Yeah. 
Does anybody else have a, a question they want to or comment? Who hasn't spoken yet? Yeah, Tom. Hi, I'm Adrian. Um, great comments um, and your presentation is fantastic. Thank you very much. My, uh, my, my partner said um, that she thinks that your charts are not um, are not boring, they're deep. So I just wanted to echo what she had said. And I think it's echo the long for what I was saying is that we need a little bit more time to, uh, to fathom them, to take them in. So, um, so just so you, you have that confidence. Um, but I also, um, I this is my first um, East West Psychology uh, um, um, presentation. I, I'm, I'm in the MFA program. I'm a writer, and I started EIF. So I have a, um, I don't have a background in this, but I do have a background in, in the Buddhist um, part of it. So I'd like you said that you are the yoga and the Buddhism and the, uh, uh, the ways of looking at this from many different perspectives, and I look forward to having more Thank you, Tom. We lost you there the last sentence or two. Um, but I think I got most of it. I, what I'm not sure is whether there was a question there at the end, like specific one. I'm sorry, there was not a question. There was a comment. Can you hear me now? Thank you. Um, I, uh, I, I was, um, I, I wanted to say that there was a that that it's helpful for me because I have one or two different ways of looking at what you're talking about, not yoga and not the not the yoga, but the Sanskrit and the Pali and the um and the Buddhist and then also um and so having you say uh, and speak to a larger um uh, breadth of of knowledge and understanding helps me to enter into this conversation with more of a um i don't know i don't know anything about yoga or indian um uh, philosophies so i I'm, I'm i'm glad that you're able to then share that with us and uh from from many different perspectives even if just tiny um you know asides or translations into the buddha's um uh, perspective for example um so i thank you for that yeah thank you tom Thank you for naming that, because that, that's what I, is in particular for this presentation, that's what I had in mind, you know, because we tend to, to think that uh, scholars or people in academia, you know, they, they need to know their craft, I guess, ideally, right, and in a specialized niche, <clears throat> but in my mind, they would also, they, them, me, they would also need to, how to convey that, you know, for people that are not as specialized as the person is. And I feel that this particular topic lends itself to that. Because, you know, in a, con in a more like uh, concrete way, yeah, there's Christian yoga these days, you know? There's yoga with goats. There's uh, yoga that you're sweating and you're looking at yourself in the mirror. And there's uh, the, the yogas and the tantras in the in the Buddhist tantric tradition. And so <clears throat> almost has the, the word has become synonymous with spirituality, with like has become planetized. It's part of part of why it's, it's, it's there. Um, and at the same time, of course, the proposal, it is it is grounded and, and the more formal yoga tradition. And I wouldn't just name two things about that that I probably helpful. One is that, interestingly enough, uh, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, they're normally often read as world transcending, advocating, you know, like this world denying sort of approach, right? And, uh, but certainly that's not the case in my usage. And there's other scholars that 
don't necessarily see it in that way, like from the Samkhya red or perspective system, but more integrative. And, and we do know that even, you know, it's been questioned like whether Patanjali was actually, who and when, and that we do know that it has influences from Jainism and Buddhism, that scripture. Um, yeah, so there's that. And the second part I wanted to say is that, uh, yeah, thank you for the tables, the charts, because <laughs> I've been trying to find a way that is more user-friendly and uh, yeah, just more like maybe like a pictogram form or, but I, yeah, I have charts for now. So I'm glad that it does help to get some feedback from that way. Yeah, so thank you, Tom. Anybody else? We still have a, technically, I think, five more minutes, but Enrique. You're muted. Thank you. Hi, I'm Enrique. I'm second semester ICP. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I really enjoyed the charts. Uh, my question is, where does mourning and where does uh, grief fit into all of this, if at all? Or maybe it is part of it and um, anything along those lines that you can elaborate on. Thank you. Absolutely, Enrique. Thank you for being here. Um, yeah, I've thought about that a lot, actually, because... Um, I have, I guess, two main strands that I can share with you about the, the mourning and the grieving. And so the, the one hand, it's a lot of the psychological literature points at the realization that there's so much grieving to be done if we want to heal individually and collectively. And there's so much in other words, there's so much repression taking place as to what's happening that that's creating a huge monster, so to speak, a huge shadow. It's deepening and it'll keep deepening and it'll keep us tied in this vicious cycle of suffering. So as long as we don't do that, we're going to stick around there. And so there's a, a great urge of creating spaces, both uh, as a society and individually, to be with the grieving, to be with the loss, and to rescue those dark emotions from the taboo of repression. So ritual, ceremony, meditation would be some of the key ways that we can contribute in creating those spaces. Of, co of course, talking, talk therapy and like that, but I you see my favoring there already and you feel that talking is fantastic and it also that has its limits uh, and i would I'd go more for like the more symbolic languaging for the grieving you know uh, so there's one strand and the other strand is the more contemplative one um, that promotes perhaps just this is perhaps oversimplifying but promotes a uh, not such a hands-on approach as like you know bring an offering to your grief and talk to it and put it in the chair but more internal perhaps more of an internal disposition of um creating that same space but at the level of awareness not repressing that but like making within ourselves if i may use a little more the the metaphor the laboratory or the workspace internally, so as to our clients or practitioners or teachers have this ability to um, put in a way to see the vortex of trauma and actually see it and not get hoovered by it, uh, but to like make space for it and find ways that I can relate to it from a more um, centered place and more equanimous um, place is fantastic and so 
one way to do that is to um, contemplate that grieving or that source of conflict or pain, but uh, feel supported, feeling the good company of your allies and friends and teachers and spiritual mentors, because that would provide the grounding for us not to get sucked into that. And maybe when is the time to do some cathartic yogic move there to actually do it and have and do it in a way that um, that is healthy and just to come to an end to this. I, I love I'm quoting um, Freud of all people because Freud at some point said something like, you know, if suffering has something to teach to us, I'm paraphrasing it. Uh, societies would be, you know, enlightened now, which is certainly not the case. And for me, this question about grieving and how to the right relation to suffering, uh, it highlights the importance of crafting this contemplative way of approaching to it that advocated by, you know, the yoga of the earth community and many other things, that it is not necessarily suffering itself but uh, the way we relate to it. And so to end the idea is that we need to depri deprivatize our suffering, you know, it becomes visible, and need to, we, we do need to find other ways to uh, metabolize it and process it. So as to the previous pain and suffering becomes a... Uh, fertile soil and offering for the earth community. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Adrian. Yeah, very important question. And um, maybe just close to our closing here, but yeah, it's, I think it is important also, like um, in the chat here is sort of being brought up Yoga is planetized and continues to be commodified to satisfy the Western capital's desire for profit. And that Luna threw that in the, the message there. And I think it's important also to, yeah, to name the that that yoga as a I as a concept, as a practice, a praxis, you know. Um, I think that it like all valuable things, it is a, a pharmacon in itself. It's 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 a powerful tool that can elicit the shadow, you know. Um, it can be used, it can be taken out. It can be taken out of its context. It can be taken and used towards different goals of becoming different, um, different, um, you know, different and kind of, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, it can be used within a, within a radically different context towards different means that it's maybe deterritorialized from its original culture or whatnot. And so I think that the culture industries is definitely, that's, that's that relationship I think we all have to really critically um, engage with to kind of try to, to to parse out some of the ways in which which these um, like yoga as a as a subjective and a, and a cosmic technology of of individuation and and uh, and whatnot I think that it's that that's that's I think part of this you, the uniqueness of this moment, the historical problematic that we find ourselves in, and how we relate to knowledges of the past, you know, and I think that's why what your work is addressing. You know, you brought it up right at the very beginning. This very clearly, like the shadow side of of what it is that we are trying to wrest ourselves from, and and exactly how yoga is 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 a valuable resource to do that. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I think that that's that's to me is, is super central. Um, and that discrimination, you know, coming from the, like Viveka, I guess, coming from the yogic tradition, you know, that that's, there's a lot of ideas that we can continue to kind of use to sharpen discrimination, sharpen the ways in which we can kind of, you know, um, kind of separate the, the, they from the, we really, I think in a way, because I think the culture industries, as it's theorized by, Adorno Hork Horkheimer to go back to that tradition, but that they kind of diagnosed modern capitalism. Bernard Stiegler is another great thinker who kind of more contemporary sense to, took that critique um, right up into like digital capitalism and, and algorithmic governmentality in a way, and really is is helping us see how 
how um, ontological these problems are, if, to take it from a metaphysical perspe perspective, but it's really not the, it's not such a simple job. And to, to really ontologically continue to kind of like, um, to, can you, to can you continue to kind of get deeper and deeper into, you know, that the ecology of ourself, the ecologies of the, of the community and parsing out the, the, the we in which we are building the earth community together consciously using yoga as a technology to do that technology of becoming. And then the they, which is the culture industries or the, or the new age, or there's different ways to express it, but which are really reducing people to, to, um, to, you know, like data mining or like reducing them to consumers and within the, within the machine, you know, so that's, I think that's really uh, important to name as well and, and, and bring out. And I guess maybe this is just, just the last question on my side. Um, but it seems as though speaking ecologically that information is a big, you know, digital um, capitalism is based on the, 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 the speed in which information is, is created and then moves around the world. Information is moving faster than thinking itself. <laughs> and so that whole paradigm is changing. And I th sometimes think about how we expose ourselves and how we are um, subjugated to be exposed to certain regimes of information. And how, how if we think about that from an ecological standpoint, the, like an information ecology can become very polluted. You were using that word as well. And it seems as though that is, is to me, really, um, again, one of these, these ideas that it just seems to be very um, pronounced and all pervading at this time is that there's this, this kind of this war on how, how it is that we are going to, how, it, how information is, is going to be dist distributed and, uh, and weaponized too, you know, and so in that sense, I guess, it's that the uh, that feeling of, of despair and different topics that are uh, different words that you were bringing up earlier. Um, it, I've been I've been thinking about the younger generation in this and how they're born into a world that I wasn't born into. They're born into a, a, a like a saturation of technology and information that I wasn't born into, and I'm trying to relate to what that might be like. But um, Bernard Steeler, for instance, has when when he was alive, but he was in dialogue and contact with the younger generation of people, and he was he brought out the idea that, or not brought it out, but he identified and was trying to work through this in his work. But the idea that there isn't um, there is no potential to generate a new future, because the potential, the reservoirs of potential, are individually, but they they. They're, they rest in cultural ecologies. How do people get inspired? How do their imaginations work? Like, how do we unleash imaginative forces that can help create a new world? Um, you know, and I think that that's a it's a really um, it's a very astute point, but it's also very hard to accept too. But in the sense of what happens if this 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 kind of if our our e e information ecology starts to drain potentials to even think about the possibilities of a new world. And so that's sort of the, I guess the, you know, that would be the pharmacology of, of digital technology in a way playing itself out. But um, I, I don't know. I just think that's a very challenging um, thing to think about. And I do try to relate to that, uh, the, the younger generations who are, are being born into a world where it's like the uncertainty of of the next 20 or 30 years is is directly in their face and they're having to deal with well why do i even invest in building a future why do i do anything if the fact is that things are you know so anyway maybe just uh some comments um based on that because that relationship of the the human and culture nature and technology um if if we look at those as not so interconnected i mean very interconnected but not so separatable either because that solution can't be just to turn our backs on technology. But I'm just wondering your thoughts in, in maybe a general sense along these lines. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, this, this would be a whole other, you know, presentation. But uh, what I you know, what, what's coming for me right now is the, uh, by the notion or idea of impermanence, uh, we, I believe that we can impermanence and uncertainty. And the uh, crown jewel of the 
spiritual practice, as you name it, as and Patanjali is Viveka. Uh, I, I think regardless of, of what the future holds, if we, um, one invitation is to develop the strength of heart or spirit or the enough discernment so as to choose life whether the end of the world is tomorrow you know like that's in a lot of the uh, more experiential um, offerings that I do time and time again we arrive to that let to that edge of like what if and I came here for more of a uh, to gain a sense of certainty about the future and about the AI is not going to conquer the world and technology and humans are going to, I don't know, like right. what I tell them, like, who am I? I don't know. But what I do know is that we can keep our practice going. What I do know is that we can keep refining or the, the, the sort of prashna, right? Of discriminatory awareness as to what, what matters. And um, from the approach of this presentation, what matters, and not only in this presentation, what matters is life. What matters is life in the center of the altar. And really like, then things can align them, themselves from there. Because I often question myself about my despair and my anxiety about the future and the reality that's gonna that my daughter is gonna face when she's 20 you know she's gonna be four in a month and a half and i get so oh that i don't want to think about it i want to but you know when i remember my practice and what it is it what is it that i do oh i get i get friendlier with that scenario and I go, you know what, maybe this is just an invitation for all of us here to um, entertain. Maybe my level of anxiety is proportional to my level of one, uh, potential ignorance, but two, that is more user-friendly, of my level of attunement to the actual life capacities of the planet to regenerate itself in spite of um, my own limitations so what I'm the sort of the haiku move that I'm that I try to do to myself there is okay who am I to get so frustrated and and just so wound up in my own anxieties when I look at myself amidst the mystery of life in the pla on planet Earth, like who am I? I don't, I don't have a clue of the capacities of the Earth system or herself to like move move along. So my anxiety is like, ah. then it, it's something that I don't need to do as much. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but. Because this goes along with the grieving and the idea of necessary of grieving. But then I've found in myself that it comes to a point where, okay, it's okay now, you know, like actually now the work is to trust. Because another way to say this is that my anxiety might be proportional to my inability to trust in life. And how do I go about doing that? Growing discerning awareness. Because we do know, or at least the teachers know that because life and reality, they're kind, they're beautiful, they're full of love. And so can I allow myself to trust in that? And that's where, as you're naming um, Jonathan, I think that's where the yoga comes or whatever other practice, right? Uh, and so, yeah. Those those are the thoughts that came to my mind to share. Thank you for that. Adrian, I just want to jump in for a second and, and thank you for your response. A, a, a Buddhist nun many years ago uh, said to me that our suffering is in direct proportion to our inability to accept what is at any given moment. This doesn't absolve us of the necessity of staying engaged 
and working to make things better but to to not to not be subsumed you know to not to not be consumed with that is uh, the work of presence um, and engagement it's being able to stay engaged so thank you i'm wondering jonathan if uh if we've kind of come to the end gone a little bit over but yeah. i think that the conversation got really kind of rich yeah. at the end you yeah wanna, you want to take over I think unless adrian you have anything to end with um but i think we could close here no it's good I, i'm my gratitude thanks thank you jonathan for the invitation stefan and i'm so happy to come here and join hearts and minds with you all yeah thank you yeah thank you so much and and this i think these this um type of uh, getting together and joining hearts and minds through dialogue and it is part of the practice you know like you said naming the fact that it is you know how do you extend uh avoid or or even out the existential existential blues <laughs> you do get in your practice you know sometimes it's like as much as i'm studying sometimes these these kind of uh challenging areas of critical studies it's like i need to put the book down and and play music you know my practice but yeah let us uh that, that your your talk has been a wonderful um um opportunity for all, us all to i think engage in the the practice of jnana yoga in a way the yoga of knowledge and <laughs> so thank you so much and we'll uh we'll see everybody again i hope for stefan's uh talk coming up in a couple of weeks um and i apologize to those of you who the the link didn't smoothly get out to you there was uh my email got blocked for some reason right before this event but i will um make sure I get the link to you more efficiently next time. But thanks, Adrian. Thank you, Stefan, and all of you who have attended. Thanks, everybody. See you soon. Thank you.